Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. This is Rylan again with another essay of George Orwell. A quick introduction before we begin. I just wanted to let everyone know that, uh, well, I was browsing around on YouTube recently and I found some other audiobooks, and a lot of them I find are narrated by AI voices, which I don't particularly like, but I'm not sure about you guys. I prefer to have books read by people. Uh, so I've decided, uh, in lieu of that, that I am going to not really correct the mistakes I make, and I'm also going to be drinking my cup of coffee while I read. So I hope that adds a bit of a human aspect to it. Today I'm going to be reading Looking Back on the Spanish War by George Orwell, uh, and I'll also now going forward be adding a little bit of context if there's certain words or certain concepts that don't get explained. Uh, this was all written in the 40s, so there are some things you might not understand. Uh, so for that sake, George Orwell, if you weren't aware, uh, Eric Blair was his real name. He fought for the, what is it, the Workers' Party of Marxist Unification for the Republican armies in the Spanish Civil War, which took place in the 30s, uh, sort of as prelude to World War II. Um, when he uses the word phalangist, he is referring to the fascist forces. The Civil War was fought between Franco's fascists and the Republican forces, which were kind of backed by the communists. So that's a little background for what he's talking about. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, grab a coffee, grab a drink, relax. And today, uh, we are listening to Looking Back on the Spanish War by George Orwell. First of all, the physical memories, the sound, the smells, and the surfaces of things. It is curious that more vividly than anything that came afterwards in the Spanish War, I remember the week of so-called training that we received before being sent to the front. The huge cavalry barracks in Barcelona, with its drafty stables and cobbled yards. The icy cold of the pump where one washed. The filthy meals made tolerable by pannikins of wine. The trousered militiawomen chopping firewood. And the roll call in the early mornings where my prosaic English name made a sort of comic interlude among the resounding Spanish ones. Manuel Gonzalez, Pedro Aguilar, Ramon Fenalosa, Roque Ballastar, Jamie Donamench, Sebastian Viltron, Ramon Nouveau Bosch. I name these particular men because I remember the faces of all of them. Except for two who were mere riffraff and have doubtless become good phalangists by this time, it is probable that all of them are dead. Two of them I know to be dead. The eldest would have been about 25 and the youngest 16. One of the essential experiences of war is never being able to escape from disgusting smells of human origin. Latrines are an overworked subject in war literature, and I would not mention them if it were not that the latrine in our barracks did its necessary bit towards puncturing my own illusions about the Spanish Civil War. The Latin type of latrine, at which you have to squat, is bad enough at best, but these were made of some kind of polished stone, so slippery that it was all you could do to keep on your feet. In addition, they were always blocked. Now I have plenty of other disgusting things in my memory, but I believe it was these latrines that first brought home to me the thought, so often to recur, here we are, soldiers of a revolutionary army, defending democracy against fascism, fighting a war which is about something, and the detail of our lives is just as sordid and degrading as it could be in prison, let alone in a bourgeois army. Many other things reinforce this impression later. For instance, the boredom and animal hunger of trench life, the squalid intrigues over scraps of food, the mean, nagging quarrels which people exhausted by lack of sleep indulge in. The essential horror of army life, and whoever has been a soldier will know what I mean by the essential horror of army life, is barely affected by the nature of the war you happen to be fighting in. Discipline, for instance, is ultimately the same in all armies. Orders have to be obeyed and enforced by punishment if necessary. The relationship of officer and man has to be the relationship of superior and inferior. The picture of war set forth in books like All Quiet on the Western Front is substantially true. Bullets hurt, corpses stink, men under fire are often so frightened that they wet their trousers. It is true that the social background from which an army springs will color its training, tactics, and general efficiency and also that the consciousness of being in the right can bolster up morale, though this affects the civilian population more than the troops. 
people forget that a soldier anywhere near the front lines is usually too hungry or frightened or cold or, above all, too tired to bother about the political origins of the war. But the laws of nature are not suspended for a red army any more than for a white one. A louse is a louse and a bomb is a bomb, even though the cause you are fighting for happens to be just. Why is it worth while to point out anything so obvious? Because the bulk of the British and American intelligentsia were manifestly unaware of it then and are now. Our memories are short nowadays, but look back a bit, dig out the files of New Masses or the Daily Worker, those were newspapers, and just have a look at the romantic warmongering muck that our left-wingers were spilling at the time, all the stale old phrases, and the unimaginative callousness of it, the sang-froid with which London faced the bombings of Madrid. Here I am, not bothering about the counter-propagandists of the right, the Lunds, Garvins, et hoc genus, they go without saying. But here were the very people who for twenty years had hooted and jeered at the glory of war, at atrocity stories, at patriotism, even at physical courage, coming out with the stuff that with the alteration of a few names would have fitted in to the Daily Mail of 1918. If there was one thing that the British intelligentsia were committed to, it was the debunking version of war, the theory that war is all corpses and latrines and never leads to any good result. Well, the same people who in 1933 sniggered pityingly if you said that in certain circumstances you would fight for your country, in 1937 were denouncing you as a Trotsky fascist if you suggested that the stories in new masses about freshly wounded men clamoring to get back into the fighting might be exaggerated. And the left intelligentsia made their swing over from war is hell to war is glorious, not only with no sense of incongruity, but almost without enter any intervening stage. Later, the bulk of them were to make other transitions equally violent. There must be quite large number of people, a sort of central core of the intelligentsia, who approved the King and Country Declaration in 1935, shouted for a firm line against Germany in 1937, supported the People's Convention in 1940, and are demanding a second front now. As far as the mass of the people go, the extraordinary swings of opinion which occur nowadays, the emotions which can be turned on and off like a tap, are the result of newspaper and radio hypnosis. In the intelligentsia, I should say that they result rather from money and mere physical safety. At a given moment, they may be pro-war or anti-war, but in either case, they have no realistic picture of war in their minds. When they enthused over the Spanish War, they knew, of course, that people were being killed and that to be killed is unpleasant. But they did not feel that for a soldier in the Spanish Republican Army, the experience of war was somehow not degrading. Somehow, the latrines stank less. Discipline was less irksome. You have only to glance at the new statesmen to see that they believed that exactly similar blah is being written about the Red Army at this moment. We have become too civilized to grasp the obvious. For the truth is very simple. To survive, you often have to fight, and to fight, you have to dirty yourself. War is evil, and it is often the lesser evil. Those who take the sword perish by the sword, and those who don't take the sword perish by smelly diseases. The fact that such a platitude is worth writing down shows what the years of rentier capitalism have done to us. In connection with what I have just said, a footnote on atrocities. I have little direct evidence about the atrocities in the Spanish Civil War. I know that some were committed by the Republicans, and far more were committed by the Fascists, and they are still continuing. But what impressed me then, and has impressed me ever since, is that atrocities are believed in or disbelieved in solely on grounds of political predilection. Everyone believes in the atrocities of the enemy and disbelieves in those of his own side without ever bothering to examine the evidence. Recently, I drew up a table of atrocities during the period between 1918 and the present. There was never a year when atrocities were not occurring somewhere or other, and there was hardly a single case when their left and right believed in the same stories simultaneously. And stranger yet, at any moment the situation can suddenly reverse itself, and yesterday's prove-to-the-hilt atrocity story can become a ridiculous lie, 
merely because the political landscape has changed. In the present war, we are in the cur curious situation that our atrocity campaign was done largely before the war started, and done mostly by the left, the people who normally pride themselves on their incredulity. In the same period, the right, the atrocity mongers of 1914 to 1918, were gazing at Nazi Germany and flatly refusing to see any evil in it. Then, as soon as war broke out, it was the pro-Nazis of yesterday who were repeating horror stories, while the anti-Nazis suddenly found themselves doubting whether the Gestapo really existed. Nor was this solely the result of the Russo-German Pact. It was partly because, before the war, the left had wrongly believed that Britain and Germany would never fight, and were therefore able to be anti-German and anti-British simultaneously. Partly also because, official war propaganda, with its disgusting hypocrisy and self-righteousness, always tends to make thinking people sympathize with the enemy. Part of the price we paid for the systematic lying of 1914 to 1918 was the exaggerated pro-German reaction which followed. During the years of 1918 to 1933, you were hooted at in left-wing circles if you suggested that Germany bore even a fraction of responsibility for the war. In all the denunciations of Versailles I listened to during those years, I don't think I ever once heard the question, what would have happened if Germany had won? even mentioned, let alone discussed. So also with atrocities. The truth, it is felt, becomes untruth when your enemy utters it. Recently, I noticed that the very people who swallowed any and every horror story about the Japanese in Nanking in 1937 refused to believe exactly the same stories about Hong Kong in 1942. There was even a tendency to feel that the Nanking atrocities had become, as it were, retrospectively untrue because the British government now drew attention to them. But unfortunately, the truth about atrocities is far worse than that they are lied about and made into propaganda. The truth is that they happen. The fact often adduced as a reason for skepticism, that the same horror stories come up in war after war, merely makes it rather more likely that these stories are true. Evidently, they are widespread fantasies, and war proves an opportunity of putting them into practice. Also, although it has ceased to be fashionable to say so, there is little question that what one may roughly call the whites commit far more and worse atrocities than the reds. There is not the slightest doubt, for instance, about the behavior of the Japanese in China, nor is there much doubt about the long tale of fascist outrages during the last ten years in Europe. The testimony is enormous, and a respectable proportion of it comes from the German press and radio, these things really happened. That is the thing to keep one's eye on. They happened even though Lord Halifax said they happened. The raping and butchering in Chinese cities, the tortures in the cells of the Gestapo, the elderly Jewish professors flung into cesspools, the machine gunning of refugees along the Spanish roads, they all happened. And they did not happen any the less because the Daily Telegraph has suddenly found out about them when it is five years too late. Two memories, the first not proving anything in particular, the second, I think, giving one a certain insight into the atmosphere of a revolutionary period. Early one morning, another man and I had gone out to snipe at the fascists in the trenches outside Huesca. Their line and ours here lay about 300 yards apart, at which range our aged rifles would not shoot accurately. But by sneaking out to a spot about 100 yards from the fascist trench, you might, if you were lucky, get a shot at someone through a gap in the parapet. Unfortunately, the ground between was a flat beet field with no cover except a few ditches, and it was necessary to go out while it was still dark and return soon after dawn before the light became too good. This time, no fascists appeared, and we stayed too long and were caught by the dawn. We were in a ditch, but behind us, 200 yards of flat ground with hardly enough cover for a rabbit. We were still trying to nerve ourselves to make a dash for it when there was an uproar and a blowing of whistles in the fascist trench. Some of our airplanes were coming over. At this moment a man, presumably carrying a message to an officer, jumped out of the trench and ran along the top of the parapet in full view. He was half-dressed and was holding up his trousers with both hands as he ran. I refrained from shooting at him. 
It is true that I am a poor shot and unlikely to hit a running man at a hundred yards, and also that I was thinking chiefly about getting back to our trench while the fascists had their attention fixed on the airplanes. Still, I did not shoot partly because of that detail about the trousers. I had come here to shoot at fascists, but a man who is holding up his trousers isn't a fascist. He is visibly a fellow creature, similar to yourself, and you don't feel like shooting at him. What does this incident demonstrate? Nothing very much, because it is the kind of thing that happens all the time in all wars. The other is different. I don't suppose that in telling it I can make it moving to you who read it, but I ask you to believe that it is moving to me as an incident characteristic of the moral atmosphere of a particular moment in time. One of the recruits who joined us while I was at the barracks was a wild-looking boy from the back streets of Barcelona. He was ragged and barefooted, he was extremely dark, Arab blood, I imagine, and made gestures you do not usually see a European make. One in particular, the arm outstretched, the palm vertical, was a gesture characteristic of Indians. One day, a bundle of cigars, which you could still buy dirt cheap at the time, was stolen from my bunk. Rather foolishly, I reported this to the officer, and one of the scallywags I have already mentioned promptly came forward and said, quite untruly, that twenty-five pesetas had been stolen from his bunk. For some reason, the officer instantly decided that the brown-faced boy must be the thief. They were very hard on stealing in the militia, and in theory, people could be shot for it. The wretched boy allowed himself to be led off to the guard room and to be searched. What most struck me was that he barely attempted to protest his innocence. In the fatalism of his attitude, you could see the desperate poverty in which he had been bred. The officer ordered him to take his clothes off. With a humility which was horrible to me, he stripped himself naked, and his clothes were searched. Of course, neither the cigars nor the money was there. In fact, he hadn't stolen them. What was most painful of all was that he seemed no less ashamed after his innocence had been established. That night, I took him to the pictures and gave him brandy and chocolate. But that, too, was horrible. I mean, the attempt to wipe out an injury with money. For a few minutes, I had half believed him to be a thief, and that could not be wiped out. Well, a few weeks later at the front, I had trouble with one of the men in my section. By this time, I was a cabo, or corporal, in command of twelve men. It was static warfare, horribly cold, and the chief job was getting sentries to stay awake at their posts. One day, a man suddenly refused to go to a certain post, which he said quite truly was exposed to enemy fire. He was a feeble creature, and I seized hold of him and began to drag him towards his post. This roused the feelings of the others against me, for Spaniards, I think, resent being touched more than we do. Instantly I was surrounded by a ring of shouting men, Fascist! Fascist! Let that man go! This isn't a bourgeois army! Fascist! etc. etc. As best I could in my bad Spanish, I shouted back that orders had to be obeyed and the row developed into one of those enormous arguments by means of which discipline is gradually hammered out in revolutionary armies. <clears throat> Some said I was right, others said I was wrong. But the point is that the one who took my side the most warmly of all was the brown-faced boy. As soon as he saw what was happening, he sprang into the ring and began passionately defending me. With his strange, wild Indian gesture, he kept exclaiming, He's the best corporal we've got. No he cabo como el. Later on, he applied for leave to exchange into my section. Why is this incident touching to me? Because, in any normal circumstances, it would have been impossible for good feelings ever to be re-established between this boy and myself. The implied ac accusation of theft would not have made any better, probably somewhat worse, by my efforts to make amends. One of the effects of safe and civilized life is an immense oversensitiveness which makes all the primary emotions seem somewhat disgusting. Generosity is as painful as meanness, gratitude as hateful as ingratitude. But in Spain in 1936, we were not living in a normal time. It was a time when generous feelings and gestures were easier than they ordinarily are. I could relate a dozen similar incidents, not really communicable, but bound up in my own mind with the special atmosphere of the time. The shabby clothes and the gay-colored revolutionary posters, the universal word of the word comrade, the anti-fascist ballads printed on flimsy paper and sold for a penny, the phrases like international proletarian solidarity, 
pathetically repeated by ignorant men who believed them to mean something. Could you feel friendly towards somebody and stick up for him in a fight after you had been ignominiously searched for in his presence for property you were supposed to have stolen from him? No, you couldn't. But you might if you had both been through some emotionally widening experience. That is one of the byproducts of revolution, though in this case it was only the beginnings of a revolution and obviously foredoomed to failure. The struggle for power between the Spanish Republican parties is an unhappy, far-off thing which I have no wish to revive at this date. I only mention it in order to say, believe nothing, or next to nothing, of what you read about internal affairs on the government side. It is all, from whatever source, party propaganda, that is to say, lies. The broad truth about the war is simple enough. The Spanish bourgeois saw their chance of crushing the labor movement and took it, aided by the Nazis and by the forces of reaction all over the world. It is doubtful whether more than that will ever be established. I remember saying once, once to Arthur Kostler, history stopped in 1936, at which he nodded in immediate understanding. We were both thinking of totalitarianism in general, but more particularly of the Spanish Civil War. Early in life I had noticed that no event is ever correctly reported in a newspaper, but in Spain, for the first time, I saw newspaper reports which did not bear any relation to the facts, not even the relationship which is implied in an ordinary lie. I saw great battles reported where there had been no fighting, and complete silence where hundreds of men had been killed. I saw troops who had fought bravely, denounced as cowards and traitors, and others who had never seen a shot fired, hailed as the heroes of imaginary victories and I saw newspapers in London retelling these lies and eager intellectuals building emotional superstructures over events that had never happened. I saw, in fact, history being written not in terms of what happened, but of what ought to have happened according to various party lines. Yet in a way, horrible as all this was, it was unimportant. It concerned secondary issues, namely the struggle for power between the Comintern and the Spanish left-wing parties, and the efforts of the Russian government to prevent revolution in Spain. Uh, the Comintern was the sort of ruling party of the, or the ruling group of the Soviet Union. But the broad picture of the war which the Spanish government presented to the world was not untruthful. The main issues were what it said they were. But as for the fascists and their backers, how could they come even as near to the truth as that? How could they possibly mention their real aims? Their version of the war was pure fantasy, and in the circumstances it could not have been otherwise. The only propaganda line open to the Nazis and the fascists was to represent themselves as Christian patriots saving Spain from a Russian dictatorship. This involved pretending that life in government Spain was just long one long massacre, via the Catholic Herald or the Daily Mail, but these were child's play compared with the continental fascist press, and it involved immensely exaggerating the scale of Russian intervention. Out of the huge pyramid of lies which the Catholic and reactionary press all over the world built up, let me take just one point, the presence in Spain of a Russian army. Devout Franco partisans all believed in this. Estimates of his strength went as high as half a million men. Now, there was no Russian army in Spain. There may, not have, there may have been a handful of airmen and other technicians, a few hundred at the most, but an army there was not. Some thousands of foreigners who fought in Spain, not to mention millions of Spaniards, were witnesses of this. Well, their testimony made no impression at all upon the Fra Franco propagandists, not one of whom had set foot in government Spain. Simultaneously, these people refused utterly to admit the fact of German or Italian intervention, at the same time as the German and Italian press were openly boasting about the exploits of their legionaries. I have chosen to mention only one point, but in fact the whole of fascist propaganda about the war was on this level. This kind of thing is frightening to me, because it often gives me the feeling that the very concept <coughs> of objective truth is fading out of the world. After all, the chances are that those lies, or at any rate similar lies, will pass into history. How will the history of the Spanish War be written? 
If Franco remains in power, his nominees will write the history books, and, to stick to my chosen point, that the Russian army which never existed will become historical fact, and school children will learn about it generations from now. But suppose that fascism is finally defeated, and some kind of democratic government restored in Spain in the fairly near future. Even then, how is the history of the war to be written? What kind of records will Franco have left behind him? Suppose even that the records kept on the government side are recoverable. Even so, how is it a true history of the war to be written? For, as I have pointed out already, the government also dealt extensively in lies. From the anti-fascist angle, one could write a broadly truthful history of the war, but it would be a partisan history, unreliable on every minor point. Yet, after all, some kind of history will be written, and after those who actually remember the war are dead, it will become universally accepted. So for all practical purposes, the lie will have become the truth. I know it is the fashion to say that most of recorded history is lies anyway. I am willing to believe that history is for the most part inaccurate and biased. But what is peculiar to our own age is the abandonment of the idea that history could be truthfully written. In the past, people deliberately lied, or they unconsciously colored what they wrote, or they struggled after the truth, well knowing that they must make many mistakes, but in each case they believed that the facts existed and were more or less discoverable. And in practice, there was always a considerable body of fact which would have been agreed to by almost everyone. If you look up the history of the last war in, for instance, Encyclopedia Britannica, you will find that a respectable amount of material is drawn from German sources. A British and a German historian would disagree deeply on many things, even on fundamentals, but there would still be that body of, as it were, neutral fact on which neither would seriously challenge the other. It is just this common basis of agreement, with its implication that human beings are all one species of animal, that totalitarianism destroys. Nazi theory indeed specifically denies that such a thing as the truth even exists. There is, for instance, no such thing as science. There is only German science, Jewish science, etc. The implied objective <coughs> of this line of thought is a nightmare world in which the leader, or some ruling clique, controls not only the future, but the past. If the leader says of such and such an event, it never happened, well, it never happened. If he says that two and two are five, well, two and two are five. This prospect frightens me much more than bombs, and after our experiences of the last few years, this is not a frivolous statement. <coughs> Pardon me. But is it perhaps childish, childish or morbid to terrify oneself with visions of a totalitarian future? Before writing off the totalitarian world as a nightmare that can't come true, just remember that in 1925, the world of today would have seemed a nightmare that couldn't come true. Against that shifting phantasmagoric world, in which black may be white tomorrow and yesterday's weather can be changed by decree, there are in reality only two safeguards. One is that, however much you deny the truth, the truth goes on existing, as it were, behind your back, and you consequently can't violate it in any way that impairs military efficiency. The other is that so long as some parts of the earth remain unconquered, the liberal tradition can be kept alive. Let fascism, or pops possibly even a combination of several fascisms, conquer the entire world, and those two conditions no longer exist. We in England underrate the danger of this kind of thing, because our traditions and our past security have given us a sentimental belief that it all comes out right in the end, and that the thing you fear most never really happens. Nourished for hundreds of years on a literature in which right invariably triumphs in the last chapter, we believe half-instinctively that evil always defeats itself in the long run. Pacifism, for instance, is founded largely on this belief. Don't resist evil, and it will somehow destroy itself. But why should it? What evidence is there that it does? And what instance is there of a modern industrialized state collapsing unless conquered from the outside by military force? Consider, for instance, the reinstitution of slavery. Who could have imagined 20 years ago that slavery would return to Europe? Well, slavery has been restored under our noses. 
the forced labor camps all over Europe and North Africa, where Poles, Russians, Jews, and political prisoners of every race toil at road-making or swamp-draining for their bare rations are simple chattel slavery. The most one can say is that the buying and selling of slaves by individuals is not yet permitted. In other ways, the breaking up of families, for instance, the conditions are probably worse than they were on the American cotton plantations. There is no reason for thinking that this state of affairs will change while any totalitarian domination endures. We don't grasp its full implications because in our mystical way, we feel that a regime founded on slavery must collapse. But it is worth comparing the duration of the slave empires of antiquity with that of any modern state. Civilizations founded on slavery have lasted for such periods as 4,000 years. When I think of antiquity, the detail that frightens me is that those hundreds of millions of slaves on whose backs civilization rested generation after generation have left behind them no record whatsoever. We do not even know their names. In the whole of Greek and Roman history, how many slaves' names are known to you? I can think of two, or possibly three. One is Spartacus, and the other is Epictetus. Also, in the Roman room at the British Museum, there is a glass jar with the maker's name inscribed on the bottom, Felix Fesset. I have a vivid mental picture of poor Felix, a Gaul with red hair and a metal collar around his neck, but in fact he may not have been a slave, so there are only two slaves whose name I definitely know, and probably few people can remember more. The rest have gone down into utter silence. The backbone of the resistance against Franco was the Spanish working class, especially the urban trade union members. In the long run, it is important to remember that it is only in the long run, the working class remains the most reliable enemy of fascism, simply because the working class stands to gain the most by a decent reconstruction of society. Unlike other classes or categories, it can't be permanently bribed. To say this is not to idealize the working class. In the long struggle that has followed the Russian Revolution, it is the manual workers who have been defeated, and it is impossible not to feel that it was their own fault. Time after time, in country after country, the organized working class movements have been crushed by open, illegal violence, and their comrades abroad, linked to them in theoretical solidarity, have simply looked on and done nothing. And underneath this, secret cause of many betrayals has lain the fact that between white and colored workers there is not even lip service to solidarity. Who can believe in the class-conscious international proletariat after the events of the past ten years? To the British working class, the massacre of their comrades in Vienna, Berlin, Madrid, or wherever it might be, seems less interesting and less important than yesterday's football match. Yet this does not alter the fact that the working class will go on struggling against fascism after the others have caved in. <clears throat> One feature of the Nazi conquest of France was the astonishing defections among the intelligentsia, including some of the left-wing political intelligentsia. The intelligentsia are the people who squeal loudest against fascism, and yet a respectable portion of them collapse into defeatism when the pinch comes. They are far-sighted enough to see the odds against them, and moreover, they can be bribed. For it is evident that the Nazis think it worthwhile to bribe intellectuals. With the working class, it is the other way around. Too ignorant to see through the trick that is being played on them, they easily swallow the promises of fascism, yet sooner or later they always take up the struggle again. They must do so, because in their own bodies they always discover that the promises of fascism cannot be fulfilled. To win over the working class permanently, <clears throat> to win over the working class permanently, the fascists would have to raise the general standard of living, which they are unable and probably unwilling to do. The struggle of the working class is like the growth of a plant. The plant is blind and stupid, but it knows enough to keep pushing upwards toward the light, and it will do this in the face of endless discouragement. What are the workers struggling for? simply for the decent life which they are more and more aware is now technically possible. Their consciousness of this aim ebbs and flows. In Spain, for a while, people were acting consciously, moving towards a goal which they wanted to reach and believed that they could reach. 
it accounted for the curiously buoyant feeling that life in government Spain had during the early months of the war. The common people knew in their bones that the Republic was their friend and Franco was their enemy. They knew that they were in the right because they were fighting for something which the world owed them and was able to give them. One has to remember this to see the Spanish War in its true perspective. When one thinks of the cruelty, squalor, and futility of war, and in this particular case of the intrigues, the persecutions, the lies, and the misunderstanding, there is always the temptation to say, one side is as bad as the other, I am neutral. In practice, however, one cannot be neutral, and there is hardly such a thing as a war in which it makes no difference who wins. Nearly always one side stands more or less for progress, the other side more or less for reaction. The hatred which the Spanish Republic excited in millionaires, dukes, cardinals, playboys, blimps, and what not would in itself be enough to show, one, how the land lay. Uh, a blimp refers to someone who's very sort of pro-military. It's a 1930s, 1940s term. In essence, it was a class war. If it had been won, the cause of the common people everywhere would have been strengthened. It was lost, and the dividend drawers all over the world rubbed their hands. That was the real issue, all else with froth on its surface. <clears throat> the outcome of the Spanish War was settled in London, Paris, Rome, and Berlin. At any rate, not in Spain. After the summer of 1937, those with eyes in their heads realized that the government could not win the war unless there was some profound change in the international setup, and in deciding to fight on Negrin, and the others may have been partly influenced by the expectation that the World War, which actually broke out in 1939, was coming in 1938. The much-publicized disunity on the government side was not a main cause of defeat. The government militias were hurriedly raised, ill-armed, and unimaginative in their military outlook, but they would have been the same if complete political agreement had existed from the start. At the outbreak of war, the average Spanish factory worker did not even know how to fire a rifle, because there had never been universal conscription in Spain and the traditional pacifism of the left was a great handicap. The thousands of foreigners who served in Spain made good infantry, but there were very few experts of any kind among them. The Trotskyist thesis was that the war could have been won if the revolution had not been sabotaged is probably false. To nationalize factories, demolish churches, and issue revolutionary manifestos would not have made the armies more efficient. The fascists won because they were stronger, they had modern arms and the others didn't. No political strategy could offset that. The most baffling thing in the Spanish War was the behavior of the great powers. The war was actually won for Franco by the Germans and the Italians, whose motives were obvious enough. The motives of France and Britain are less easy to understand. In 1936, it was clear to everyone that if Britain would only help the Spanish government, even to the extent of a few million pounds worth of arms, Franco would collapse, and the German strategy would be severely dislocated. By that time, one did not need to be a clairvoyant to foresee that war between Britain and Germany was coming. One could even foretell within a year or two when it would come. Yet in the most mean, cowardly, hypocritical way, the British ruling class did all they could to hand Spain over to Franco and the Nazis. Why? Because they were pro-fascist was the obvious answer. Undoubtedly, they were. And yet, when it came to the final showdown, they chose to stand up to Germany. It is still very uncertain what plan they acted on in backing Franco, and they may have had no clear plan at all. Whether the British ruling class are wicked or merely stupid is one of the most difficult questions of our time, and at certain moments a very important question. As to the Russians, their motives in the Spanish War are completely inscrutable. Did they, as the Pinks believed, intervene in Spain in order to defend democracy and thwart the Nazis? Then why did they intervene on such a niggardly scale and finally leave Spain in the lurch? Or did they, as the Catholics maintained, intervene in order to foster revolution in Spain? Then why did they do all in their power to crush the Spanish revolutionary movements, defend private property, and hand power to the middle class as against the working class? Or did they, as the Trotskyists suggest, 
intervene simply in order to prevent a Spanish revolution, then why not back Franco? Indeed, their actions are most easily explained if one assumes that they were acting on several contradictory motives. I believe that in the future we shall come to feel that Stalin's foreign policy, instead of being so diabolically clever as it is claimed to be, has been merely opportunistic and stupid. But at any rate, the Spanish Civil War demonstrated that the Nazis knew what they were doing and their opponents did not. The war was fought at a low technical level and its major strategy was very simple. The side which had weapons would win. The Nazis and the Italians gave arms to their Spanish fascist friends and the Western democracies and the Russians didn't give arms to those who should have been their friends. So the Spanish Republic perished, having gained what no Republican missed. Whether it was right, as all left-wingers in other countries undoubtedly did, to encourage the Spaniards to go on fighting when they could not win is a question hard to answer. I myself think it was right, because I believe that it is better even from the point of view of survival to fight and be conquered than to surrender without fighting. The effects on the grand strategy of the struggle against fascism cannot be assessed yet. The ragged, weaponless armies of the Republic held out for two and a half years, which was undoubtedly longer than their enemies expected. But whether that dislocated the fascist timetable, or whether, on the other hand, it merely postponed the major war and gave the Nazis extra time to get their war machine into trim, is still uncertain. I never think of the Spanish War without two memories coming into my mind. One is of the hospital ward at Lerida, and the rather sad voices of the wounded militiamen singing some song with a refrain that ended, Una resolución, luchar hasta el fin. Well, they fought to the end, all right. For the last 18 months of the war, the Republican armies must have been fighting almost without cigarettes and with precious little food. Even when I left Spain in the middle of 1937, meat and bread were scarce, tobacco was a rarity, coffee and sugar were almost unobtainable. The other memory is of the Italian militiamen who shook my hand in the guard room the day I joined the militia. I wrote about this man at the beginning of my book on the Spanish War. Uh, that book is Homage to Catalonia, by the way. And do not want to repeat what I said there. When I remember, oh how vividly, his shabby uniform and his fierce, pathetic, innocent face, the complex side issues of the war seem to fade away, and I see clearly that there was at any rate no doubt as to who was in the right. In spite of power politics and journalistic lying, the central issue of the war was the attempt of people like this to win the decent life which they knew to be their birthright. It is difficult to think of this particular man's probable end without several kinds of bitterness. Since I met him in the Lenin barracks, he was probably a Trotsky Trotskyist or an anarchist. And in the peculiar conditions of our time, when people of that sort are not killed by the Gestapo, they are usually killed by the GPU. But that does not affect the long-term issues. This man's face, which I saw only for a minute or two, remains with me as a sort of visual reminder of what the war was really about. He symbolizes for me the flower of the European working class, harried by the police of all countries, the people who fill the mass graves of the Spanish battlefields and are now, to the tune of several millions, rotting in forced labor camps. When one thinks of all the people who support or have supported fascism, one stands amazed at their diversity. What a crew! Think of a program which at any rate for a while could bring Hitler, Petain, Montague Norman, Pavlich, William Randolph Hearst, Streicher, Bluchmann, Ezra Pound, Juan March, Cockatoo, Thiessen, Father Coughlin, the Mufti of Jerusalem, Arnold Lunn, Antonescu, Spengler, Beverly Nichols, Lady Houston, and Marinetti all into the same boat. But the clue is really very simple. They are all people with something to lose, or people who could for a long who long for a hierarchical society and dread the prospect of a world of free and equal human beings. Behind all the ballyhoo that is talked about godless Russia and the materialism of the working class lies the simple intention of those with money or privileges to cling to them. Ditto, though it contains a partial truth, with all the talk about worthlessness of social reconstruction not accompanied by a change of heart. The pious ones, from the Pope to the yogis of California, 
are great on the changes of heart, much more reassuring from their point of view than a change in the economic system. Petain attributes the fall of France to the common people's love of pleasure. One sees this in its right perspective if one stops to wonder how much pleasure the ordinary French peasant or working man's life would contain compared with Petain's own. The damned impertinence of these politicians, priests, literary men, and what not who lecture the working class socialist for his materialism. All that the working man demands is what these others would consider the indispensable minimum without which human life cannot be lived at all. Enough to eat, freedom from the haunting terror of unemployment, the knowledge that your children will get a fair chance, a bath once a day, clean linen reasonably often, a roof that doesn't leak, and short enough working hours to leave you with a little energy when the day is done. Not one of those who preach against materialism would consider life livable without these things. And how easily that minimum could be attained if we chose to set our minds to it for only twenty years. To raise the standard of living of the whole world to that of Britain would not be a greater undertaking than the war we are now fighting. I don't claim, and I don't know who does, that that would solve anything in itself. It is merely that privation and brute labor have to be abolished before the real problems of humanity can be tackled. The major problem of our time is the decay of the belief in personal immor immortality, and it cannot be dealt with while the average human being is either drudging like an ox or shivering in fear of the secret police. How right the working classes are in their materialism, how right they are to realize that the belly comes before the soul, not in the scale of values, but in point of time. Understand that, and the long horror that we are enduring becomes at least intelligible. All the considerations that are likely to make one falter, the siren voices of a Patain or of a Gandhi, the inescapable fact that in order to fight one has to degrade oneself, the equivocal moral position of Britain, with its democratic phrases and its coolie empire, the sinister development of Soviet Russia, the squalid farce of left-wing politics, all of this fades away, and one sees only the struggle of the gradually awakening common people against the lords of property and their hired liars and bumsuckers. The question is very simple. Shall people like that Italian soldier be allowed to live the decent, fully human life which is now technically achievable, or shall they not? Shall the common man be pushed back into the mud, or shall he not? I myself believe, perhaps on insufficient grounds, that the common man will win his fight sooner or later, but I want it to be sooner and not later, sometime within the next hundred years, let's say, and not sometime within the next ten thousand years. That was the real issue of the Spanish War, and of the present war, and perhaps of other wars yet to come. I never saw the Italian militiaman again, nor did I ever learn his name. It can be taken as quite certain that he is dead. Nearly two years later, when the war was visibly lost, I wrote these verses in his memory. The Italian soldier shook my hand beside the guardroom table, the strong hand and the subtle hand, whose palms are only able, to meet within the sound of guns, but oh what peace I knew then, in gazing on his battered face, purer than any woman's. For the fly-blown words that make me spew still in his ears were holy, and he was born knowing that I had learned out of books and slowly. The treacherous guns had told their tale, and we both had brought it, but my gold brick was made of gold, oh, who ever would have thought it. Good luck go with you, Italian soldier, but luck is not for the brave. What would the world give back to you, always less than you gave? Between the shadow and the ghost, between the white and red, between the bullet and the lie, where would hide your head? For where is Manuel Gonzalez, and where is Pedro Aguilar, and where is Raymond Fenelosa? The earthworms know where they are. Your name and your deeds were forgotten, before your bones were dry, and the lie that slew you is buried under a deeper lie. But the thing that I saw in your face, no power can disinherit. No bomb that ever burst shatters the crystal spirit. Written in Autumn 1942. Uh, sections 1, 2, and 3, and 6, printed in June 1943.